<laughs> Camtasia's on fucking crack, dude. The whole dang thing. Did you accidentally let the cocaine bear in? It's I all let, high now? I let cocaine bear in, yes. <laughs> He came in, he got cocaine all over my keyboard, up. and Camtasia snorted it right out from between the keys. <laughs> Damn, dude. Which also, you know, cleared all the Cheeto dust and shit out of there, so... That's helpful, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hashtag thank you, Cocaine Bear. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for not killing me. <laughs> thank you for simply wiping off the Cheeto dust and not... Brutally destroying my anus. He was here to snort the cocaine, and the Cheeto dust was just a bonus. Ah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not a bad bonus. It's pretty good. <laughs> he was like, oh, what is that? Oh, and he's like rubbing his nose. He's like, oh, is it? Is that uh, che Cheeto, Cheeto dust? Oh, yeah, buddy. Oh. And then he just kind of sauntered back out of my room, and I was like, dude, there's a fucking bear in here just now. Yo, cocaine but cheese flavor this time? I never knew they came in- I never knew cocaine came in cheese flavors! Holy Yo, dude, shit. cheese flavored cocaine, let's go! <laughs> let's get it, boys! <laughs> oh, God. Ah, uh, uh, imagine that- imagine if they had flavored cocaine, though. Shit, dude. Imagine if they had cocaine. Imagine, dude. I think the world would be a better place if everyone could have cocaine. I, I hope you're not, you didn't start recording. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Nonstop like, oh, yeah, Debate, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Casually promote <laughs> drug abuse, you know? <laughs> hey, bro, we do things differently over here on Major Ego, okay? I was, I'm, I saw I was silent, I was like, I'm waiting for the shoe to drop, I ain't saying shit right now. <laughs> Jerry was like, I've been here before, I know how this works. <laughs> Something's <laughs> wrong, I can feel it! <laughs> God. Uh, just like the end of the Act 1. Yeah. Something's definitely very wrong. <laughs> Jeez. Alright, well, before we get started, it's probably pretty <laughs> self-explanatory, but today we are talking about Doki Doki Literature Club. Uh, you may be asking yourself why, on a Danganronpa podcast, we would be discussing this. And the answer is, uh, fuck you. It's my podcast. I can do what I want. And these two are Monica Simps. Also that. Yeah. And no. Well, kinda. But I'm more of a Sayori Simp. Okay, get out of here. People who watch the uh, Among Us videos probably remember Joey, or Snufflebutt, who is here with us today because he just recently played through Doki Doki for the first time before Plus released. Which is also part of the reason we're talking about it today. And we also shit talk him on the Danganronpa podcast because we watched his first reactions to everything. Yeah. Oh, that was that was painful, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was just, you know, I don't want to bring up bad memories again. Let's not talk about <laughs> going tough for today, please. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I'm still, my heart is still broken over going to dude. My boy. I haven't even recovered, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone's ever going to recover, Joey. That's, me, a, that's a kind of heartbreak good. that you don't recover from. Me, an unfeeling bastard laughing maniacally in the distance. Yeah, unless you're Jeremiah. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, somewhere between the void of Jeremiah and Amvi, there's a normal person with a normal range of emotions. Yeah, who was it that said that? Was it Percy? <laughs> yeah, it was Percy. It was Percy. <laughs> it was Percy. <laughs> Still one of the best quotes I've that's ever heard. That's a legendary from. line, dude. I was, I was like, damn, you! I got roasted so hard right there. <laughs> Because Ambie's an emotional <laughs> bastard, and that means I'm on the other end, which means I have no emotion. Which <laughs> it was wrong. such a good roast, dude. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, I don't uh, I don't really have show notes for what we're going to do today. I'm thinking we just kind of give a quick rundown of each character, and then we mostly just kind of get into the, the meat and the beans of what today's episode is really about. And that's the fucking there writing. Because say warning, what you want I, about Doki Doki, there's a lot of shit going on underneath right. the surface of this game. And fair, uh, warning. Uh, fair warning, I do not like this game. Yeah, which is also yeah. why I wanted to bring Joey on, was to just kind of yeah. keep conversation interesting. Right. But uh, yeah. I've only seen Dylan play through it, I was not interested in it. 
I, it peaked when Before, Sayori died for me. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. a, a bit of a spoiler. So, before we go any further, I will say if you haven't played Doki Doki yet, uh, go get Plus. It just came out. Listen no further until you fucking play, if you really care. Because uh, okay. this game is fucking great. And, like I said, it's got a lot of shit going on. So. Yeah, too bad Jer already spoiled some of it. What well, a shame. If they're cooking on this podcast, they already <laughs> either know what's going on or they do not give a fuck. Yeah. If, yeah, they're, if they're listening this far, anyway. <laughs> I still recommend going and playing it, or at least watching a playthrough of it. It's, I think from start to finish for one run, uh, I think it takes, on average, maybe like four or five hours. That's if you're going slow. Because I, I read really mm-hmm. fast, so I go through runs in like maybe two or three. So, it, it's really not that long. And plus has added a bit of replayability to it also, so you've got a reason to go back through it a couple times. But uh, on that topic, if you are past the spoiler point and you have played Plus, uh, we have not done the side stories yet. I have no idea what those entail or contain. I don't really know much else. I spent most of my last few nights unlocking the side stories so that I could play them later. But I haven't gotten to them yet. So if you're looking for discussions on side story stuff or what those bring to the characters, unfortunately, we have nothing on that yet but we could probably do a follow-up episode at some point after we do the side stories and just kind of add to what we know. But... Yeah, I'm just... You're just what? I'm not. I'm sitting here. I'm I'm just patiently waiting for Advance Wars to come out. Oh. (laughs) From the Nintendo Direct. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I've been waiting 13 years, Dylan. (laughs) God. All right. Well, let's get into the first character... Uh, who should who should we start with here, boys? Sayori. Sayori for sure. Yeah. yeah. Obvious one. I don't think we really need to cover the protagonist. He's just kind of your average visual novel. He's just faceless me, protag. You know? Yeah, he's just me. Just he, a he says a lot of things that you can manga. just kind of nod to and go, yeah, that's pretty. That's a lot like me, actually. He's got a couple lines in there that even I nodded at. I was like, that's exactly something I would say in this situation. He's just your average, yeah. relatable, faceless protag. He's literally a TV monitor in a fucking school uniform. That's all he is. So yeah. Oh, that's where he gets the poem words from. From his screen face. <laughs> oh, big screen. <laughs> God. Secretly, the protagonist is pyrocynical in disguise. Dang. <laughs> Knew it the whole time, dude. <laughs> Alright, uh... So, yeah, starting with Sayori, she's... Honestly, I think, commonly, one of the girls that most first-time players will go for, just because she has that... She has that link to your character that pre-exists the game that you guys have been childhood friends and neighbors since you were young. So I think a lot of people just would have been like, oh, well, let's pursue that since there's already something there, you know? Yeah, yeah. that was me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> it's a common visual novel trope. The person with the tri- uh, childhood friends is usually one of the uh, first ones that most people go for. Yeah, and it's also established pretty early on that you guys have been friends for a while, but in recent, like, I think year like just one year maybe year and a half almost two you guys haven't spent that much time together because Sayori wakes up late for school so you guys stopped walking to school together and she stays late for the literature club so you guys stopped walking home together and protagonist does say at some point that he started being more reclusive and just staying in his room and playing games and reading anime or reading manga the whole time sorry and uh reading anime yeah (laughs) shut up he just became a weeb dude technically technically yeah Pretty much. Technically, you do read anime, Jared. It's called uh, fucking subtitles. Okay. Oh God. Sometimes we watch it dub too. Eat my oh, you ass. Don't. But, but, but the dub can also have it, the subtitles just there for funsies <laughs> if you want. Yeah. Um, if you're double you're dot fucking, dot. If you, yeah, if you're a fucking mongoloid. <laughs> I mean, hey, man. Some people are mongoloids. Don't discriminate. It's fucked God. up. Like you. Yeah. Got him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I totally know you watch dub subtitle with the subtitles on, Joey. <laughs> Alright, so... Alright. Sayori is the bubbly archetype, whatever you want to call it. She's Little Miss Sunshine. She's Sayori. hyperactive. She's 
constantly happy. She's got tons of energy. She loves to eat. I, I will say personalities... Uh, I will agree with you on this, Jer. Most of the personalities for these characters are pretty straightforward and basic. Oh yeah, you have the uh, you have the Dairy Dairy, the Yon Dairy, the Soon Dairy, and then you have Monica, which is <laughs> she's, she's Monica Dairy. She's Monica, dude. She's I think she's the only real, which I think also kind of fits into what we're going to talk about with Monica later. But it just adds a little bit more to the writing for Monica, like her justification for her being the only like real person in the game, you know. Right. So, but yeah. I mean, she's Monica's kind of like, uh, like a commie dairy, like a god complex sort of. Cause I mean, she really is like the god of this game. Cause she's self aware, which makes yeah, her completely different from the others. Also, how much of that is Monica, and how much of it is being the club president? Because when uh, oh, true, at the end yeah. of the game, Sayori becomes just as obsessive and power hungry. So it, it's hard to say I mean, for sure. I mean, I guess being the president means you're already at the top. So I guess being able to, like, actually affect things as, like, the top of the top at the club yeah, kind of has an effect, I would think, I would guess. I don't know. Which I think is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, one thing I do like about Sayori, though, uh, her role in the story for the big twist between Acts 1 and 2 she does have a little bit more writing on her that's layered because like her big negative trait quote unquote that monica manipulates later on is her depression and she makes it so bad to the point where sayori kills herself um but it's also kind of hinted at pretty much from the get-go that sayori has depression between the waking up late and the protagonist mentioning that he always had to like help her clean her room up and stuff like that like It's just little details that you catch at the beginning, but you take it more as her just being airheaded. And then later, after the shit hits the fan, they're the little details that are, like, the first that you forget. And it's not until maybe you do a replay or you watch a video of someone pointing those things out where you're like, oh, she was always like this. It just, Monica, like, magnified it and made it work yeah because wow. because me going through the the game for the first time i i went sayori all the way man she was my favorite yeah. and i i picked up all of those little things like even her being hungry like people mm-hmm. stressy when they're depressed even yep. something that's so character defining as that yeah. bring brung up later like it all the little pieces just connected so well for me and that's why i think like besides like monica of course i think she's probably the best written one with Monica, you know. I, yeah. I, I, Monica. Caught on, I caught on real quick, but that's because I'm... I go through everything whenever I read something with a fine-tooth comb, and I analyze the shit out of everything. So I kind of yeah. picked up that she was depressed along the way, and then you get to the big... the big no-no question with two wrong answers, and none of them are right, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, she's gonna kill herself after this, isn't she? <laughs> yeah. The, this is a let's fun little... About that. No, let's talk about that scene, Dylan. Let's talk about how well, you I, fucking I was... fooled me. <laughs> you bamboozled me, okay? Okay, so, for context, uh, like I said at the start, Joey recently played through Doki Doki. He somehow avoided most major spoilers. The only thing he did manage to avoid was Sayori hanging herself. But he saw it through a meme, and not even through like any actual in-game imagery or actual spoilers, so he just knew it was something that happened. So I played it up that Doki Doki had all these warnings because it was a dating sim that just tackled more serious issues as far as like mental illness went, which it honestly kind of does. Uh, mm-hmm. Just not in the yeah. way that I was telling Joey it did. <laughs> and, and I, I told I told him that uh, I told him that Sayori's suicide was avoidable. You just didn't say the wrong thing. And then when it came time for him to say either he loved her or she was his dearest friend, I was like, "Here you go, Joey. Just don't say the wrong thing." While I maliciously like wrung my hands like a Saturday morning cartoon villain, knowing full well that both options were the wrong thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you don't understand how just intern I screamed internally so much after you said that like I got God so hard man how <laughs> dare you how oh, da- god damn you Dylan did, did this fuck, to, fuck you up more than Kaede uh no no, <laughs> no. which is funny you bring that up Jer because thematically both 
Kaede and Sayori's deaths have the same kind of impact on their uh, respective games. And they die the same yeah. way, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, too. <laughs> Let me just go hang out with Sayori. <laughs> on that note, though, so that we can move on to the Sayori like meat and potatoes, um, here in Sayori's trivia, I actually didn't know this. Uh, it says in the fan pack booklet that Dan Salvato, the creator of Doki Doki Literature Club, chose Sayori as the character who inadvertently sets off the horror side of the game largely because he knew it would hit anime fans the hardest, seeing the archetypal girl who wants everyone to be happy be the one to commit suicide. Hmm. And it worked well for me. <laughs> yeah, it works really well. Uh, um, I think a lot of how Sayori works through the first half of the game is really well done. Because she's either... You're with her, and she's happy that you guys are spending more time together. Or you're getting closer to Natsuki and Yuri, and she's happy that she brought you to the club, and you're making new friends. Like, it, it's like standard dating visual novel bullshit where like she has that prior connection to you but the game doesn't try to guilt you with her in any way about not choosing her over the other girls you know uh until yeah. you start getting close to the festival and that's when her depression starts kicking in and then it becomes like a manipulative game where she's like sad that you're not with her or she's sad that you are and there's no winning and it's just E even my replay when Plus came out, my first uh, run through Plus uh, to try and un unlock the side stories, I knew what was going to happen. I've always known what happened because I've played this game before. And it's still the feeling of guilt of the shit that she says when you're, like, getting close to the other girls. Like, when uh, Natsuki or Yuri are over at your house over the weekend and they're about to kiss you and then they step back because Yuri, or not Yuri, because Sayori walked up. And after they leave, Sayori, like, tells you, like, oh, my imagination was being mean to me, so I had to come see it for myself, and I was right. Like, the shit that she says is supposed to make you feel awful, and it still does. You know? Yeah. Like, even after like... all this time of me knowing and having played the game before, I replayed it again, and it still made me feel like that, even though I knew what was going to happen. Yeah, because, you know. like, for me, when I uh, when I went through it, like, what, before I, you told me, like, you lied to me the whole entire <laughs> time when I first started. Right, right. Uh, I was just like, God damn it, man. I, I actually, like, how could I, how could I be such a fool to actually keep on spending time with her when I should have spent time with the others just so she could be happier? Right. Because she wanted me to be with the others to make her feel happier because I'm feeling happier. And I was like, God damn fucking damn at me yeah. why did you do this it's they 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 pat uh what am i trying to say here they pair you thank you they pair you up with an endearing character that you get attached to and then they put you in an unwinnable situation with her where you're gonna lose her no matter what and that makes it hard and you know like jer said earlier even after the shock is gone from her being dead it's still like it's like I said, the guilt is still there. It still, like, makes you feel bad, you know? Yeah, it's like, it's just ominous. It's like, uh, the it, it, when I first played and saw the eyes, the first thing that I, that I thought of was Chihiro's eyes during uh, Chapter 2 when we find uh, his body. Yeah, the body. And just, discovery. it's the eyes. The eyes are just so haunting that they stuck with me for so long. Yeah. Even after long finishing uh, DR1 and recently finishing DDLC. Funny enough, that's how this conversation started to do a Doki Doki episode on the podcast. Was I, I made a joke that uh, finding Sayori hanging is literally a Danganronpa body discovery. <laughs> I mean, it pretty much is. is. It's, I mean, it's yeah, shot it's in the same different. kind of way. It's fucking unnerving. Yeah. The art is different. Like... It's got the we it's got the creepy oh. music that's like the fucked up version. Oh, also Joey, the music that plays when you find Sayori hanging, uh, the music oh, there's boy. literally a glitched up version of the regular Doki Doki theme. That song is called Sayonara, and that's one of my favorite you, little details you, in the game. <laughs> you know, know why that triggers me even more? Is because it's just, just another fucking Sayori hanging joke <laughs> in its own uh, game. Not only that. <laughs> 
But it just fucking reminds me of Angie from V3, dude. And you know how I feel about oh, Angie yeah. now. I don't <laughs> like her at all. Oh my god. <laughs> You're bringing up horrible flashbacks again. How you re you're reminding me of Ibuki's death now, and how she hung as well. God damn it, Dylan! <laughs> this the is DD in DDLC uh, stands for damn it, Dylan. <laughs> damn it, Dylan! <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly feel that right now. God damn you, Dylan! You little shit. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to the actual Sayori bit that I really wanted to get mm -hmm. to. Th this is probably other than Monica and her influence across the game. This is probably the only major discussion we're going to have this episode. So, mm -hmm. fucking strap in, because there's a lot of shit happening here. There's shit that you'll appreciate here, Jer. I know you don't like this game, but bear with me here. Um, we probably talked about this already in the past when Doki Doki first came out, but Joey and I had this conversation just last night about just how important Sayori is, and it wasn't something I really noticed until I was doing my first replay uh, she is very, like, writing-wise, for the narrative, Sayori's arguably more important than Monica, just because her death, and the build-up to it, and the, like, lasting damage once she's gone, is just so, like, it's so, like, world-shatteringly effective. You know, it, it affects every little thing of the narrative. Every little thing happens in Act 2 because of what happened to Sayori. Every little thing building up to Sayori's death is, you know, like I said with the depression, it's all, like, hinted at from the very beginning. And her death is, like... Because, you know, that's the whole, like, draw of the game, is that it's, it, looks a cute, it looks like a cute and innocent little dating sim. But when you get to that halfway point with Sayori, it turns into a fucking horror movie that you're just kind of stuck along for the ride on. And it just... And Ooh. It, yeah, it Ooh, just boy, did fucking toys myself. with you. It <laughs> my favorite jump scare that happens twice in this game is in Act Two, and it's when the girl's eyes just fucking pop and explode. I don't know why it just like oh, I think it man. happens. I think it happens with Natsuki first, where she's just standing there with a with a spray. Oh, I'm pretty and sure her, it does. And yeah. then her eyes just pop, like both of them just. And they just, like, fall out of her head bleeding, and then all of a sudden she resets and she's fine. It just makes me laugh because it's just so silent, and then it's something that should be so horrible, but it's played up in just this such nonchalant way, and it, it just fucking makes me <laughs> laugh. But the, the tone of the overall game is set through Sayori killing herself, and, you know, it's not just her. There's a lot of Monica manipulation in there behind that, but... The whole tone of the game doesn't even really have any, like, deep, dark elements until that. It just, like... You know, like, the lie I told Joey about the game just being a game that dealt with serious, like, mental health-style issues, like... That's... It literally could just be that. It's not until after she's gone that you start getting glitches and bugs and the game just outright not working and all of the, like, very less-than-subtle Monica fourth-wall breaking... And right. it just I am writing tip, dude. Remember to save your game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like she's got uh, plenty, she's got plenty of fourth wall breaking stuff before that, but it's all like subtle because it's under the veneer of the fucking game not being a horror game. It's just a dating sim. Like you you know from the get go that she's like your stay in tutorial character that just kind of babies you if you need help. Like, you know that from yep. the beginning. So when she says stuff like, Monica's writing tip of the day, don't forget to save your game, sometimes you come to a difficult decision. It's a good time to save before you make a choice you might regret. Like, that sounds kind of scary, <laughs> but in the context of what oh, you know boy. at the time, you're just like, okay, yeah, that sounds like something she would say. And then she's like, wait, what am I talking about? <laughs> and then it just moves on. Like, you don't think anything of it because you don't expect anything, like, scary to happen, you know? And it's like, the whole tone of the game is just relaxed and happy and girly, bubbly, doki-doki literature club. But the second Sayori is gone, it turns into fucking a horror game. And, you know, it, it's... It, it just becomes a war zone between Natsuki and Yuri at that point, to be honest, it man. It kind of does, yeah. But it just, it changes everything. The whole game gets flipped on its head, and... I just... God, it's just so good. I can't even remember the exact words I used. So, 
I need to. I mean, on. I mean, I we can talk about you now. <laughs> yeah, hold on, I got it, I got it. So yeah, you said you love how symbolic Sayori as a character is because she's you know the positive, happy, sunshine one. Yeah. So her death at the half point point is you know symbolic of how the normalcy is just fucking dead and gone. Yeah. Just like your just waifu, like your kiddo. waifu <laughs> kiddo. Yeah, that's, uh, that's that what I'm trying to say. Is like Her death at the halfway point isn't just the character death. It's the symbolic death of the normalcy that the game is putting on for you. Because once Sayori's gone again, that's when the game falls apart. That's when the horror comes out to play. That's when it throws the mask of the fun dating sim away and just becomes an outright psychological horror. And Sayori's yeah, death it's... is symbolic of that because she herself was the fun, happy, sunshine character. Yeah, and it, like you said, it, everything just descended into madness while just Monica was just being there. Yeah. And ruined everything, you know? She kept on messing with everyone. Exactly. It's, it, it's so good. It's so good, man. It's, her death uh. is the turning point, the narrative, the game, the tone of everything from that point on. Yeah. And like I said right here in the chat, uh, she's I would say she's the next best written character to Monica, not so much for who she is as a character, but for what she is. Because she's yeah. like... Like I said before we started recording, she's... Sayori and her death to Doki Doki is what Leon and his execution is to Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc. It's a, it's a tone setter for what to expect moving forward from that point. Because, like, Leon's right. execution yeah. is, like... Before that, you get uh, Blast Off, which I think Jar and I discussed already, is it's a fine execution, but it's a little more cartoony because, like, when the rocket yeah. comes down, it opens, and it's just bones. And the only other execution I can really think of that is on that same level of, like, slight cartooniness is Ryoma in V3 just because of the bones. But the lead-up oh. to the bones is less cartoony, so I wouldn't quite put it on the same, like wavelength but leon i thought, I thought just, you were about to say mondo in terms of mondo's cartoon. is just ridiculous <laughs> but, fair fair but no like blast off is just rocket goes up rocket comes down bones fall out and you're like okay and then that's before you even start playing as makoto but leon's execution yeah, that's before is before you, you know what that's before what you know what an actual execution is like yeah because leon's execution you've already been playing makoto you've gotten comfortable in the game you've met the characters you've lost a character you find out it's leon and his execution is fast it's brutal it's bloody and it fucking gets the point across that if you kill and get caught you will get fucked up and you will die like that that's the point where the game stops holding your hand and is like yeah shit's getting real bud yeah, no, this game will not hold your hand. Unless it's the first, you know, first case, of course, where it literally just gives you the name. But besides that, <laughs> never holds your hand. Yeah. Never. Doki Doki's the same way. It's it's not even really much of a handhold. It's just like I said, Monica's there to just kind of like, haha, I'm the tutorial character, haha. Uh, but once Sayori fucking dies, that's it, bud. That's... It's out the window. You can expect nothing but, like, if you think this is bad, oh, just wait for what's going to happen when you boot this game back up, big boy. Like, it's <laughs> it's fucking scary, man. It, maybe not so uh, much on a second playthrough, but first playthrough, if you're going into this totally blind and you get caught off guard by this kind of thing, this game will fuck you up. Yeah, just, just Sayori That's and her spike friend. just never being there again. And just... Oh, Oh. Yeah, I won't say his name, but that's why our friend had recommended the game to you because he got to Sayori's death. Yeah, what, one of our like, one no. of our friends. That's how I first got into Doki Doki. Was one of my friends played through it, expecting it to be a normal game. He got to Sayori's suicide. He didn't play any further, but it disturbed him so much that he basically told me like, "Yo, you should play this and uh, let me watch." So I played through all of Doki Doki with him watching me and Jer watching most of it, and. Uh, yeah, I, I fucking enjoyed it. I was like, by the end of the game, I was like, dude, this game's fucking sick. This shit slaps, dude, as the kids say. But yeah, dude. Yeah, I I couldn't get over it. I was like, dude, this is amazing. So, I, I'm glad that we have an episode talking about it now. Yeah. But oh. and and to, and to continue with you know the good old DR parallels with this game, just like, ah. Uh, 
the Taka point that I wanted to mention, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, Sayori always breaks up Natsuki and Yuri's fights at the very start of the game when she's still alive. Yeah. Like, whenever whenever it escalates and they it, start, it to the, you know, the cat fight. They, they have the same fight, because Acts 1 and 2 are basically the same. It's just Act 1 has Sayori, Act 2 doesn't, and it's all glitched and fucked up because of that. But when you get to the yeah. fight with... When you get to the fight between Yuri and Natsuki in Act 1, Sayori's there, and she de-escalates it before it gets too bad. And in Act 2, she's not there, so it escalates until one of them says something horrible that you don't get to hear because Monica takes you out of the room before you, you can hear it. But Yeah, and if Sayori was still there, she just would have not allowed that to happen to begin with. Yeah. But she wasn't, and that's part of the why it just escalated still, because Sayori... The happy sunshine wasn't there to uplift people again. She is, like you said with Taka, she's the game's moral compass. And after she's gone, everything just kind of falls apart and goes further and further down the hole. Yeah, exactly. Because when Taka dies in Chapter 3, that's that's just another game's... That's another one of DR1's like setting the tone after yeah. Leon's death. Where, I, again, you mentioned this in the Taka podcast, and I want to bring this up again. Because, uh, just Taka never would have allowed the, like, Byakuya yeah. and the others to treat Sakura that horribly. And if Taka was still, th still there, he would have, he would have broken his moral compass for the first time. He would have broken a rule and bitch slapped some pimps, bro. Yeah. That, <laughs> no, I don't think so. That, that's kind of the point <laughs> oh, that I yeah, wanted to real. make with Sayori, with you, Jer. Was it, like, Sayori, very similarly to Taka, was, like, mm -hmm. the proverbial death of the moral compass in this right. game. Just like once Taka was gone and Trigger Happy Havoc, everything started going more downhill between like them excluding Sakura and her eventually killing herself and just everyone kind of like losing it from there until the big grand finale. Like Sayori's very similar in that regard here because again, once she's gone, the whole game starts falling apart and it just doesn't get any better. <laughs> not not as far as happy sunshine game goes anyway. <laughs> So, but yeah, she's, uh, she's got a lot of stuff going on here. Not as much as Monica, but enough that I think it warrants discussion. And right. like I said, uh, like I said at the start, it's all like, it's not like in your face. It, it's all very subtle with Sayori's stuff. Like the depression mm -hmm. hints at the beginning you might pick up on if you're paying attention, but most people aren't going to, most people aren't going to catch that right away. You know? And, I mean, just because a few people catch it, like Jer does yeah, on the first playthrough, yeah. that doesn't mean well, it's not well-written. Because there's plenty of yeah. things that people can pick up on. I mean, I picked up on Celeste and her bullshit my very first time playing through Trigger Happy Havoc. It doesn't mean that oh, Celeste yeah. murder in Chapter 3 and Danganronpa 1, it doesn't mean it's not, like, badly written. Because, honestly, it's not that bad. It's a pretty straightforward... It's probably right. the most well-done double murder in the series, by far. But... <laughs> It, it just means I caught on to her trick really quickly. And some people will, some people won't. It's the same way with this game. You're either going to catch yeah, it Celeste, or you won't. Celeste's thing was just so easy. Like, she just com acts completely out of character, which is why it's so easy to catch on. At least for me, at least, you know? Well, it's also the fact that she's controlling the narrative that you're running through. She's constantly the one saying, like, oh, it was up here, let's all go there. No, it, we're, let's all move down here. Like, she's constantly the one controlling, like, where you're going during that whole escapade, and that was another thing that made me suspicious, was I was like, you seem to just be right in the center of this, huh? You're directing the flow of traffic here. Yeah, not only that, but, like, you know, she's the one character in which we see attacked but never killed. Yeah. Why would a murderer just not kill their victim immediately? That just creates too many like holes in the argument to be found out yeah objection makoto very beginning of the game he got knocked the fuck out yeah by mondo, yeah, by mondo. <laughs> oh wow by mondo but that was in front of everyone not in private there's a difference man true, true. and <laughs> all right well let's move on to yuri and we'll run through yuri and natsuki real quick before we get to monica mm -hmm. um yuri and natsuki probably the as much as I love Natsuki, they're probably the most least interesting out of the four girls because they're kind of, like, opposite. Another thing I noticed on my multiple replays I had to do through Plus to unlock all the side stories is that Yuri and Natsuki are very, like, 
teeter-totter based where it's like it doesn't matter if it's act one or two with sayori or without sayori uh if you lean more towards one the other one will just stop interacting with you completely like if you start writing all your poems for natsuki and write none for yuri she will just basically reside herself to being alone and you won't even be able to share poems with her in the classroom anymore like it I think the third poem that you write for her, she won't even like talk to you. You're the pro tag will just be like, she doesn't look like she wants to talk to me, so I'm just gonna leave her alone. And you don't even like share your poem with her. And vice versa, if you write all your poems for Yuri, the Natsuki just accepts that you don't like her and she just becomes like more dismissive and she just doesn't read your poem either. Yeah, that's one of the things that I find to be weaker of this game is, is that once you choose someone, the other ones just, the other characters just get sidelined, and I, I'm not a big fan of that, yeah. and I didn't like that. It, it makes a little more sense in Act 2 when everything is already kind of, like, fucky, but... True. In, in Act 1, it's just, it's kind of like with Sayori, it's, it just kind of makes you feel bad for picking the girl that you like, but it's like, you know, what do you want me to do? <laughs> But, yeah, I, as far as not counting the side stories go, because, again, we haven't played those yet, so we don't know, uh, Natsuki is the most underutilized out of the four girls, unfortunately. There's plenty of hints and some, like, one or two in Act 2, like, outright confirmations that her dad abuses her. But in Act 1, it's more hinted that it's psychological, and in Act 2, it's more just, like, outright confirmed that it's physically abusive. Like, he starves her. The, one of the hints is that he doesn't... I think Monica's the one who tells you this, that he doesn't give her money for lunch while she's at school, and he doesn't leave her anything to eat in the house unless he cooks dinner. So part of her short, petite stature and body type is due to her being malnutritioned from not getting enough to eat while she's still a growing child. Um, and then there's the glitch dialogue in Act 2 where she's talking about her manga and she keeps it in the classroom because she says her dad would beat the shit out of her if he found it. So, yeah, it's... Yeah. It, there's a lot and of that's... hinted stuff towards Natsuki, but she still doesn't get that much compared to the other girls because, like, Yuri even takes over your fucking game, basically, in Act 2 because of how obsessive she is. You, Act 2 becomes a Yuri route whether you want it to be or not. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing with, like, Natsuki, is that between, like, Natsuki, Yuri, and Sayori, is that Natsuki never directly tells you about her issues, while Sayori, you have a one-on-one -on -one talk about her depression, which yeah. I think was awesome, and same with Yuri. Like, she goes up in your face about what's going on with her. Yeah. Which, Natsuki, you just find out by other characters telling you what's going on with her. And the few, Not from her the few exactly. good moments that you do get with her, she doesn't tell you much. Like, uh, the moment that Joey got to earlier, but before we started recording, Joey was watching through, uh, Doki Doki routes on YouTube, so he didn't have to, like, play through the game again, and, uh, he's watching through the Natsuki route, and I think it's, is it after poem two or three when she goes in the closet? Uh, poem two, I believe, yeah. yeah. you get the closet CG of Natsuki yeah. where Monica put all of her manga on the top shelf of the closet where she can't reach it again, so she's on an unstable chair trying to, like hoist it down but they're big awkward boxes and she falls on top of you and it creases one of her manga and she was calling you a perv just before that because she thought that you were trying to look up her skirt while she was standing on the chair but after she falls she creases one of her manga in the fall and she tries to smooth it out but she just kind of gives up and throws it down and she just starts crying and she breaks down a bit as a character and just kind of just tells you, like, no bullshit. She's like, look, I'm having a really, really shitty day. And I don't mean to take it out on you, and I'm sorry. And then she's just kind of like, you're so nice to me. And I don't really get why. And then you kind of, like, Protag's just like, hey, it's okay. We all have bad days. And just kind of comforts her and picks the mess back up. And then after that, she kind of goes back to normal because she's collected herself. But, like, that's... Other than maybe the weekend, the Sunday thing that you spend with her baking, I think that's the most, like, intimate that you do get with Natsuki, because I think you have more moments of intimacy with Yuri and Sayori. 
in either uh, act. yeah because you don't even get to spend time with natsuki in act two because yuri takes it over and when you do try to spend time with natsuki she glitches or she's just outright mean and she just makes you not want to spend time with her because monica is fucking with her so yeah which i mean it's a shame but like that one moment in the closet really was just well done that's her and that's i her really best enjoyed moment, it i think yeah i have to agree because like i i just feel i relate to that so hard because like one little thing goes wrong when i'm having a band and i'm just like this sucks like why am i here dude yeah oh i just relate so hard so uh yuri on the other hand is natsuki's our tsundere as i'm sure you figured out she's mean not necessarily mean she's not mean mean she's mean in a nice way if that makes sense I don't know, I'm, sh I'm sure it does to somebody, but she's, she puts up this, like, veil of I'm the best at what I do, because she kind of has to, because between her dad and her not having that much confidence in herself and just stuff like that, she feels like, God, what was it, she, she's constantly, like, looking for improvement, like, at the end of her route in Act 1 before Sayori kills herself, I think it's poem three she like begs you to tell her that her poem is the best and she even tells you she's like even if you hate it just just tell me it's good please and she kind of breaks yeah. down in front of you again and i think that's a good moment too but i don't think it's as good as the moment in the closet yeah and and i think what adds to that is just her short stature in general her petite stature yeah. is that she just feels inferior to everyone because of how small she is and how badly treated she is she's constantly by treated her own like members. she's inferior by everyone too because everyone makes fun of her yeah, for because reading manga is not literature <laughs> everyone's always calling her cute and dismissing the things that she's actually saying is just oh natsuki you're so cute but she's like not being heard in what she's saying yeah like she's putting actual effort into like what she wants to do she wants to create meaning out of something and they just you know dismiss it like haha eagles can fly cute stuff very cool natsuki yeah. which i mean i can totally bet that's just super no, frustrating yeah, it's, you know it's super relatable and that's why i'm sad that natsuki is so underutilized because i feel like a lot more people could relate to this kind of character compared to like the others you know but mm -hmm. Yuri Anyways, on the other uh, hand Yuri. is, uh... Ooh. Ooh, my least favorite. Stabby McStabby Stab, bitch. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I'm gonna have to agree with Joey. It's weird, because when I first played Doki Doki Literature Club, Yuri was the girl I went for most. She was my favorite. And I'm sad to say that when I replayed her route, uh, trying to unlock the side stories in Plus, I kept shaking my head, because I was like, why did I like her so much? I don't think she's nearly as interesting as the other girls. She... Yeah, because, I mean, all there really is to her is that she likes horror, and because of that, like, that just general likingness of horror... Shy, she's shy, she's a tall, up. mature figure with big booba, and she likes horror stories, so... Obviously, initial reaction, I was like, hey, <laughs> you know, like, slicking my hair back, I was like, how you doing? But, yeah, it's looking through her route again and i was talking with someone else about this earlier today too before we started recording was it like the moment i was just talking about with natsuki in the closet where she breaks down and just gets real with you for a minute about her having a bad day and talking about just you're so nice to me you know like that's such mm -hmm. a real moment and it's very emotional and one of the things about yuri that kind of kills me is that she has a moment just like this in her route but it's not nearly as emotional you i think it's one of the times you share a poem with her maybe the third time in act one when she's not acting psycho she just like she thanks you basically because you know she's a little weird she's a little in her head a lot of the time she takes long pauses in between speaking so she can kind of put her thoughts into words before she starts like talking and she thanks you for being so nice and like patient with her as a person because it's like she doesn't interact with a whole lot of other people which is partially why she's so shy you know is because she's mostly in her own head she doesn't talk to anybody else so meeting someone new who was both kind and patient with her meant a lot to her but she just kind of like tells you that 
and it's not nearly as like emotional or like real i feel as Natsuki's yeah, is it, in the closet yeah it was just it was a tell rather than show moment and i, exactly. I didn't like that that much and that's that's and, why and it that's, kills me because i i want yeah. to like yuri more especially because she's also interesting I don't think she's boring. I just think that compared to the other three girls, she has the least going on, despite everything yeah. she does in the story. And the, the other issue that I have with Yuri in general is that she doesn't feel like a character, per se. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that she feels more like a plot device to be, like, the big shocking act to sort of twist of where everything just becomes a horror game now with her, with how yeah. How she's pretty much a yandere that wants to kill, and how she just stabs herself by the end of Act Two. Well, it's not. It's not like even that she wants to character. kill. She's just outright rude and mean to the other girls once she gets too obsessive. But her whole, the reason she stabs herself at the end of Act Two is because her, uh, her obsession, just being around you, makes her heart beat incredibly fast to the point where it gives her chest pains. And uh, if you admit your feelings to her or turn her feelings down, either way. It all winds up the same. She ends up stabbing herself to death because if you tell her that you love her, it's gotten to the point where her chest is, like her heart is beating so fast that she just kills herself out of overexcitement for you admitting that you love her too. Or she kills herself just out of fucking like, well, he doesn't love me the same way. All right. And then she just kills herself. Like It's like Sayori where there's no win-win, yeah. but it's even worse. It's a it's slightly worse. worse version of Sayori's, yeah. It's it definitely... Yeah. Uh, it's another great shock value moment, I will say that. It's kind of hard after Sayori to have another effective shock value moment, especially when leading up to Yuri's death, you have plenty of other, like, glitchy jump scare things, like Natsuki's head snap. Uh, but I do think that her stabbing herself kind of comes out of nowhere for where it's placed in the narrative, and you're just kind of like, oh, oh, okay, okay, well, all right, bye. And then you're like, yeah, you're that, like, that got me. You're like, well, now yeah. what's going to happen? And then you end up getting stuck in the classroom looking at her for an entire fucking weekend. <laughs> like, cool, boy, that was, I was just like, okay, click, 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 yeah. click, click. Oh, oh, this is not going to end anytime soon, is it? Part, oh, part of no. me wanted to let you click through it <laughs> for like a long time. And then <laughs> I was like, man. and then I was like, nah, I should tell him about the skip button. <laughs> Yeah. But like another thing oh, that, another thing that's great about it too though is that as the the days and nights go on, you can see the blood like darken from red to black and you can see Yuri start like you can see her body start shutting down from being dead. Like you can see her skin get paler, you can see her eyes start to like her skin start to tighten, you can see her cheekbones kind of like become more apparent, you can see her eyes kind of sink into her skull. Like it's really subtle, but it's noticeable and it's really well done. Yeah, like for me, Yuri just felt like the shock factor character for me. Yeah, she and was... I, I just didn't like it that much. That that's 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 just me though. She's also there to serve some more like foreshadowing moments as, uh, in her dialogue because the horror book that she reads, and I think I told you this before we started recording, Joey. Uh, if you ask her in Act One before Sayori dies what her book is about, uh, she tells you kind of more of the psychological elements. Um, but she doesn't go into like any major detail. And then in Act Two, after Sayori suicide, when you start a new run, when she tells you what her book is about, she goes a lot more in depth on the horror side of her novel to symbolize the whole shift from happy, fun, doki doki to oh, you're in a horror game, bud. So. Oh yeah, bud. And she's got plenty of yeah, foreshadowing I, moments, uh, like right before Sayori suicide, after she goes home early that day. Uh, when you're all trying to figure out what you're going to do for the festival over the weekend. Um, Natsuki, I think, makes a comment about, like, the air feels off in the club today. And Yuri says that uh, stagnant air is a common tool for foreshadowing that something terrible is about to happen. And then, you know, following that, yeah, that is when Sayori moment. dies. And they make the same comment yeah. again <laughs> in Act 2 before Yuri kills herself because you're coming up on the festival. So... Yeah, this game has a lot of good foreshadowing, in my opinion. Yeah. And I really it's, it. It's fucking all over the place, but like I said with Sayori earlier, most of it is pretty subtle. It's not, like, totally in your face. There's a few that are, like... I don't know if this is new, or if it's... I don't know if it's new to Plus, or if it was in the original, but one of, uh... 
one of Monica's poems in Act 2, when you share poems with everyone, I think it's the second or third day that you share poems with people. Monica tries to share a poem with you, and it's just a glitchy mass of, like, text and paper. And it crashes your game, and it gives you the blue screen, like, oh, no, your PC ran into a problem, sad face. We're going to collect some data and then reboot your PC for you. And it brings that screen up. And then Monica comes up a moment later, and she's like, whoops, I guess my poem didn't work. Uh, hold on, let me see if I can fix this. And then she, like, your game comes back up. So it was not, it's not a real blue screen, but it's still, yeah, but like... Still, that's, that's hilarious, yeah, dude. I love that. But that's, that. like, halfway through Act 2. And, like, at that point, it's like, if you haven't caught on, you're just not paying attention, or you're just getting too, like, <laughs> caught off guard by the scares to really catch it. And either way, that's yeah. fine. But, like, that one, I think, is a little too on the nose for Monica being the, like, hidden villain. So, mm -hmm. but... Let's see, one bit of foreshadowing that I like that I just sent to you, like, a little bit before we started this was Sayori saying, I'm gonna keep writing until I die. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Oh, that's going to come so way sooner yeah. than you think, Sayori. Yeah, Jer, I don't, I don't know if you remember <laughs> uh, that, but there's a moment in Act 1 where Sayori is like, it's before, I think it's the day before, it's poem 2, because it's the day before yeah, she it's starts, two, yeah. it's the day before she starts showing her signs of depression. You show your poem to her, and she's like, oh my god, I love it, it's the greatest poem you've ever written. And then you read her poem, and you guys go back and forth, and one of the last things she says is like, Oh, I love writing poems. I'm going to keep writing until the day I die. And the protag is just like, all right, well, slow down there, kid. And like, and Monica was like, I took that person. Yeah. <laughs> Monica was like, oh, you're going to do what now? <laughs> and I laughed oh, at that. You're gonna... so, oh, you're going to... So in death. I laughed at that on my first replay because I knew that the next day was the day that she went home uh -huh. early. So I was like... Sayori, you can't just say shit like that when I know what's gonna happen. Come on. <laughs> you, can't you can't just say <laughs> irresponsible things like that when Monica's listening. Yeah. Come on. You you should know better, Sayori. But to backtrack, that's what I'm talking about, is that this game is full of foreshadowing dialogue, and it's all subtle bullshit like that. And that's why I love oh, it, is dude, because the majority of it... Monica. Yeah, oh. and the majority of it isn't in your face. Most of it is just goes right under the radar if you don't know what's going on and most of it like that line with sayori is stuff that like maybe you didn't catch your first playthrough and when you're going through the game again watching someone else play or playing yourself you know what happens next you see a line like that and you're just like eh, i see what you yeah. did there you clever <laughs> funny, little bitch funny. you like, but yeah, I, I I still I still stand by this. I I still think the best piece of foreshadowing was Monica's writing tip and being like, Haha, go save. Like I like yeah. I brought it up so many times already, but like it's just a really good bit of foreshadowing. Well, because it's not like and it's so subtle. It's not like malevolent or like hinting that it's gonna get scary in any way. It's literally just a hint that Monica's aware she's in a video game. And then she plays it off after she tells you that with the whole, like, wait, what am I talking about? Oh, it doesn't have anything to do with writing. <laughs> oh, well, let's move on. Like, she plays it off in, in a ways. normal way that you would expect a character like her to do in a visual novel. So it doesn't make you think anything of it until you go back, you know? Again, yeah, she's just tutorial lady. Because she has, she doesn't have a root like the other ones. So it's already right from the bat. She's tutorial lady because she's not one of the three chibis that we see. When uh, we we start writing the poems, exactly. She's so not that's one already the, like she's one, not one of the chibis poem. that you can write for. So I don't know. So yeah, that's it's, that. It's really good. I think it's really good. I think it's really well done. Uh, a lot of the dialogue is great, and there are plenty, like I said, plenty of lines that foreshadow it like that. And most of it just will you just won't catch it unless you're on like a second playthrough. But yeah, it, it's great. Um, but we should probably move on because we're at almost an hour now, and uh, yeah, I want. Let's talk about the main girl herself. Yeah, you know? Th this is where the majority of the video is probably gonna go to because we're probably gonna go for another little while longer here because Monica is by far the most important character in this game, and she has got a lot of fun bullshit going on. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, boy, did I enjoy it? This uh. is Monica. Little Miss Poster Girl for Doki Doki Literature Club. She wrote the game description on the Steam Store page and on the Doki Doki Ooh. website. She is all over the advertising for this game. She has her own fucking um, 
what is it? She has her own uh, Twitter. It's an official Twitter run by, I think, the creator, Dan Salvato, that he tweets in character as Monica from occasionally. And it's mostly just high school girl stuff, but occasionally they also post actual, like, official art of Monica hanging out with the other Dokies, which I think is very fun. But... Yeah, that's pretty cool. She and is... oh, oh, yeah, and to go to the, like, the Steam page, uh, like, stuff information that you were talking about... In the actual game, when it, everything starts going glitchy, it literally has Steam page information mm-hmm. talking about, like, what the girls' personalities is like yep. in the actual game. And I love that when you go back to the history log. Oh, it's so good. Yep. She is... And this is prob- this is the main reason why I compared her to Junko in the last episode, and this is part of the reason that I wanted to do a Doki Doki episode. She is the villain the direct like main villain of this game and she is a very well done villain i love everything about this character she's got so much good stuff going on from a writing perspective and i i know even jer will agree with that even though he's yeah. not a huge doki doki fan monica is a very well written villain i said she's the only character that literally matters in this fucking story yeah and even, like, one of the details that I always love pointing out to people is that from the very get-go, they try and, like, hint you in that there's something different about her. Because one of the, uh, if you look at the, like, poster that has all four Dokis standing together from, like, the title screen and stuff, uh, all the Dokis wear knee-high socks with white, blue-tipped, uh, shoes. Monica has dark thigh highs with white shoes with pink tips. So, like, just yeah. from the get-go, you notice, oh. okay, something is different about her. But, yeah, that's that's the thing about the very title screen itself, is that it doesn't actually show us, like, that she has black socks while the others have uh, white socks. Exactly. Because Monica is so far up near the foreground mm-hmm. that we can barely see the black socks. You can see, so you can see them, so it's, it's that enough the that's there. Out. But, yeah, like, you're not going to notice the pink shoes either because she's you yeah. don't get to see them on the title screen but it's again it's just one of those little subtle things that this game does that is really well done because it does it's not in your face it's just oh this is monica and you're like oh okay cool and you notice the design is a little different from the other three girls but you don't think anything of it until you get yeah. to a later point in the game and then you look at her and you're like you know yeah. that I probably should have uh, thought a little more on that, huh? <laughs> like, yeah, I, yeah. I caught her something up was different her because you know me. We should everyone should know about me about this one now, but I'm extremely anal about character design. Yeah, and the socks were the very mm-hmm. first thing I, I noticed. I'm like, yeah, there's something up with you. <laughs> yeah, and I mean yeah. even the names, dude. Sayori, Natsuki, Yuri. They all end with the Y. But then that, there's that, Monica. That, yeah. that's just, then that's there's Monica. That's Ooh, pushing boy. it. That's pushing it. That's a coincidence. Yeah, <laughs> that, that might come more to coincidence. But hey, man, that's it's true, though. It's true, man. You, you can't tell... You can't, it's, it's too much of a coincidence when all three of them have a, a name that ends in I, except for Monica. Well, if you want to... Too wanna, much of a coincidence. Joey, you got to work on your argument on that one a little bit. If you want to do a better argument of that, you should do the argument that since all three names are more Japanese stereotypical and Monica is just Monica. Monica is, a, oh, Monica yeah, is more of an American true. style yeah. name. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's also fair. Yeah, that's a better argument for the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, fair. But still, my point stands, because it's true. So, Monica <laughs> is... She doesn't really have, like, a trope character type in this game she's just which i think is another like kind of subtle thing that sets her apart from everyone else is she's not really she doesn't she can fit into like multiple trope types i suppose but she's not really one specific one and that's what kind of makes her feel a little more real as a character to me um she is miss like she's miss popular the fucking stupendium song he literally says in a lyric that she's brains and beauty and that's pretty much what the protag describes her as she's smart she's been on like school board she was like in the debate club before she left to start the literature club like she's very smart and she's obviously very pretty and popular among school and it's kind of like 
I guess that's kind of like part of what they do subtly to make you like her is that she's not like a stuck up snob as far as popularity goes. She's more down to earth. Because when you ask her about the debate club, she said that she didn't like all the politics surrounding all the higher up, more popular clubs because it always comes down to like club budget and like big events and things like that. And she would have rather like started her own club, i.e. the literature club, that was something that she both enjoyed and could make her own and make special. So already they kind of present you with this like more down to earth but still successful like type girl. Which I'm it sure is pretty relatable and a lot more realistic than most Japanese to, girls in this type. To, to chime in, they were setting her up to be the Kuderi archetype, the cool, calm, collected type that barely, rarely shows her emotions. But since she was programmed, in the meta sense, to not be able to get with the protag, they, she could not become a Kuderi type. So instead, she became the villain of the entire game yeah. instead. Yeah, which is what I'm saying. She, You Ooh. can put her into, like, multiple trope types, but she doesn't necessarily fit into any specific one. Right. Which is why but I was it, saying it makes her feel more real, because if you take a real human person, not one person is going to fit into a single trope type. They're usually going to be a mix of multiple. Because humans are complex-ass creatures, you know? Mm-hmm. So... I, I th- oh, yeah, speaking about, like, her popularity and stuff, and, like, just wanting to try new new things like, you know, a regular person. Mm-hmm. The piano. Oh! I loved Joey how the piano came in at piano. the very end. Oh, my God. That was so fun to figure out that the one playing the piano the entire time was Monica yeah. in a real meta sense, and I loved that so much. I don't think it's so much that she was playing the piano during the game for the in-game soundtrack, but it was definitely her practicing piano throughout the game was a hint that she was writing the song that she sings for you yeah. at the end. Yeah, and that's just what I really enjoyed about that. Li- Again, just so many little hints sprinkled everywhere, mm-hmm. and that little piano one was so satisfying to finally see the conclusion for That's... I think I think that's a great way to like end the game and end Monica as a character is just her like giving you a song that she wrote for you from the bottom of her heart that's just very personal while she's erasing everything from existence, you know? Cuz why don't yeah, forget that- while you're listening to her song and listening to her herself sing to you she is erasing the game in front of you while the credits roll. She's literally deleting the CG art, she's deleting everything, and then she gives you a note that says, thanks for playing and thanks for making me happy for a short amount of time. Uh, goodbye, love, Monica. And then you have to reset the whole game file just to be able to play it again. So Yeah, yeah, I really like that little bit as well. Just, just physically deleting everything. And then even if you go, like... This is what I found out from, like, going and watching other YouTube videos about it. Mm-hmm. But seeing, like, all the other files that you can go through for little hints oh, yeah. is so cool. After Sayori dies, there's literally so a file that pops up in your in-game, like, in your... If you go on your computer, your game folder, where it has the actual game files that you can actually fuck with, right after Sayori dies, you can go and look at a file where Monica left a note basically talking to herself where uh she's like ah shit i didn't fucking i didn't like fuck anything up did i oh man hold on maybe i can (laughs) fix this and then there's like a dot 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 and she's like actually you know what it would probably be easier if i just straight up delete her she's being a bit of trouble anyway and then that's how she came to the conclusion to just erase sayori from the game and this is all shit and like all throughout act two if you randomly go into the game folder there's all kinds of like files and like pngs and shit that monica just puts in the game folder just to fuck with you yeah dude and the other thing like if you start up a new game and you just decide to delete monica from the very start and you get that secret ending where sayori automatically has that uh that uh, what's the word like sat- sapience mm-hmm. of like being a a real character, a real person, and how she just goes insane because she, it's it's the start of the game. Monica's not there anymore, so she has all this knowledge now, and it's just so cool how you can get a secret ending like that just by messing with the files right at the very start of the game. Yeah, and it, um. to continue off that <laughs> point, also, uh, when you get to Act Three, which is when you're just stuck in the classroom, uh, like the empty void with Monica and she's just talking to you 
this fucking blew Joey's mind, but she has four hours worth of fucking dialogue that she goes through in Act 3 if you either don't know what to do from that point to, like, continue the game, or if you just want to stay and listen to Monica talk. Like, she has four hours of fucking dialogue that she can go through while you're in that classroom sitting across the table from her. She has so many things yeah, to talk about and make conversations topics, about. dude. Yeah. Oh my god. I like, that's so insane to me. The fact that they put in so much effort for so many different topics like that, while staying in character for Monica is so good, mm -hmm. dude. And one of the... I'm, I'm looking at her trivia right here, and this one kind of sticks out to me, because I actually didn't know that she talked about this. I've never seen every single bit of her dialogue uh, from Act 3. But one of her trivia points here says Monica is the only girl to never be shown outside of school or in a casual outfit, and she later states that she knows this and is jealous of the other girls for having them, as well as wishing she could have, quote, worn some cute clothes for you. So. Aw, that's, that's nice. Yeah, because the other sad, girls all have casual cute, wear that you, that you get to see them in, but you don't ever get to see Monica in casual clothes because you never get to see her outside of school. All of her yeah, which again, hey man, another difference. Yeah, all of her uh, casual that up on the board. all of her casual wear comes from the like official artwork that gets posted from her Twitter from time to time, which she also has very adorable casual clothes as far as that official artwork goes. Which I don't know if all of it from her Twitter is in plus, but I have unlocked a couple pieces of that official art from her Twitter, uh, so I know some. Ooh, I know nice. some of them are in plus. I just don't know if all of them are. Um spicy also to back joey oh, yeah. up on an earlier topic one of her bullet points on her trivia here jer says every girl's name except monica's ends with an i and is explicitly the romaji anglicization i probably butchered that of transcriptions originating in the japanese language so joey actually was making a point that all the ah, girls names end ah, with an i except gotcha. monica. <laughs> you just got got jer <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i mean so. hey man I, I got you, man. I st in my opinion, that's still a reach. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fair, but still, even even the trivia's backing me up. Th this <laughs> is a fun little bit of trivia too that I love. Actually, Monica's the only girl uh, to hold a pen in the main menu on her sprite. This could symbolize her being oh. the only girl to be able to write in the game script. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. I like that a lot. Yup. So. Oh, you know what we haven't directly Dylan mentioned over, yet? Dylan gushing over here about Monica, the only thing going through my mind is, and Mr. MVP Simp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buddy, that's Dylan for you, man. But yeah, we haven't directly mentioned Monica's actual motive yet for doing all this. I, Which I think is a great motive. I covered briefly her motive in the Junko episode, but yeah, you're right. Her motive is kind of what ties her whole character together, because it's so... And like I said in the Junko episode, like that's partly why I can't get behind Junko as a villain is she doesn't have a good motivation for what she's doing. Monica on the other hand has a very like terrifying and very real one behind the sense that she knows she's in a world that's fake and she knows that she can never be happy. She doesn't have a happy ending like the other girls do. Her friends all have happiness waiting for them and she doesn't. And she honestly i can agree feels fucking cheated so she tries to make the other girls unlikable so that she can spend time with you but the game Wait, isn't the game isn't fucking built for her to spend time with you so she just bends it until it breaks completely and she's like all right yeah she just she rewrites the script she's like all right you know uh, what exactly i'm just what gonna delete everything mind. except this room a table and a couple chairs and we're just gonna sit and talk and then you as the player yeah, she are just, just like... Yeah, she just makes her own ending. Yeah, you as the player are just so like, good. I'm just going to have to fucking delete you then. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's... Yeah. It's so good. What, what do you think yeah, of like, one of the, one of the most uh, famous, like... Is it a mod or is it its own game where it's just... Hey, you have to get a happy end with Monica. Oh, yeah. That's a mod, there, There's yeah. a couple mods. There's a mod... Uh, I think the most popular mod is called Doki Doki Blue Skies. And it's literally just like full-on dating sim like happy endings with all four girls including monica but there's also a mod called i think i don't remember what it's called but it's essentially just you sitting in the classroom with monica like act three but there's actual like outside outside the windows you guys aren't just floating in a void 
and um, you yourself can also initiate conversation with her. So it's basically Act Three Monica, but like expanded upon. And you you, you yeah, can just, just like really make like... casual conversation and uh, shit with her. But yeah, but that's that's what I really like about Monica though is that she she knows she doesn't have her own route. She doesn't have her own ending. And so she can't feel that same love that the others are getting. So, like, she just screws with the actual script itself and makes her own. And, and I think that's super cool. She tells you when she shares her very first poem with you that uh, her inspiration for her poem writing has been that she's had a bit of an epiphany recently. And she outright admits in Act 3 that that epiphany was that she became sentient in her game. And she became aware that she's in a video game. She's... Yeah, and there's she's essentially oh, there's so she much has the same viewpoint on Doki Doki Literature Club that you do. She's on the outside looking in, only she's stuck on the inside instead of the outside with you. She's looking around yeah. at this world and she's seeing that it's just a fake 2D like fucking like cardboard cutout paper with like pages. And she's just like, "God, I fucking I can't live here." I need to be out there where the real people are. And she knows that she can never, like, do that. You know? Monica was what Samuki should have been. Yeah. There, There is a lot yeah. going on there. Between yeah. the two of them that could have, like, really added to Samugi. I think they came out the same year, didn't they? Didn't Doki come out in 2017? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ooh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. So. There's a lot yeah, of good Monica I mean, that shit just going sucks. on. Man. It's... I love her motivation. I I don't remember who I said it to. I think it was Jer. I might have even said it in the Junko podcast, but, like, Monica is, like, a perfect blend of fucking uh, villain in good story writing because she has great motivation, she has a great character, and as far as design goes, she's a cute anime girl, so, like, there's really no getting away from her, to be honest. <laughs> like, I mean, who, who, who wouldn't be pissed that they don't get their own route to be happy, at least? I you know? know. Like, it... It makes total sense to me. If you woke up tomorrow and realized that this world you've been living in this whole time is a world that's like a fake rendition of a real one that you can never be in and you're designed in that world to never be happy, like, I would be a little fucking upset myself, to be honest. Like, I would feel so cheated. I can understand her motivation completely. I don't agree with it because... <laughs> you know, killing your friends and destroying the world that the person you love came to, like, be a part of, there are much better ways to go about your problems than that. She's literally gone the Thanos yeah. route, where she's made it all extreme, and instead of just going a more logical route, she's just decided to just wipe things off the map, which, you know, again, brings me back to the villain point. Like, I, I get it. I understand your motivation. I don't agree with it. You know, I don't agree with your mm -hmm. actions. I can understand why you're doing what you're doing. I just can't agree with it because it's still deplorable. It's still villainous, you know? And, like, I know I keep using Thanos as an example, but he's a great example because he's probably the most well-written, well-known villain of this day and age as far as, like, major movies and story writing goes because he's, you know... What, what, yeah, was his, what was his whole story? Was his fucking, his race went extinct because of overpopulation? They didn't have enough his, resources? His whole, his whole, uh, his whole story is, is that, um, his planet was, uh, having the problem of overpopulation. Right. And he offered a solution to call half the population at random. It would be just and fair. And they called him a madman, but whatever he said came to pass, so he... He's determined to go out to the entire universe to do the exact same thing on a universal scale. Exactly. And it's like... And then... Again, it's like, you to... it, it's like, I can agree with what you're saying, and yeah, that sucks, but why don't you just double the resources instead of cutting half the population? And he's just like, yeah, you know, well, I didn't he, think he, of that. He, he can make the ar <laughs> no, no, actually, we make the argument, but like, yeah, that would be good for a time. Yeah. He, he'd probably <laughs> just make an excuse to keep doing what he's doing. Yeah. Like it's the and then the one thing I heard when Thanos was like trending, I think it was when uh not Endgame, but when Infinity War I think was about to come out or like right after it came out, the thing I heard that really kind of like made me understand good villains from bad villains is that um every villain sees themselves as the good guy. Mm -hmm. Thanos yeah. sees him, he doesn't see himself as the villain. He sees himself like the hero who's got to make a difficult decision for the good of, like, everything moving forward. 
Yeah, that's how he carries himself in Infinity War. Endgame is different. Yeah. Well, because Infinity Endgame War is also it. just, like, if you look at it from, like, a narrative standpoint, that's literally just Thanos is the main character in Infinity War. Right. So. Mm-hmm. But, uh, to bring it back to Monica, it's it's the same kind of thing. She does not think what she's doing is evil because she's she's got the understanding that this world is fake. Her friends aren't real people, so she's not really, like, hurting them. She outright tells you in Act 3, she, like, feels sorry. She's, like, apologetic to you for having you had witnessed some horrible things during Act 2. Uh, but she also says, like, she follows that immediately up with, uh, I also know that you have the same perspective that I do, that this is all is just a game, so I knew you would get over it. Like, yeah. she doesn't see them as real people, so she doesn't feel that guilty over the things that she's doing to her friends. Unfortunately, Monica doesn't know Joey, and Joey holds grudges until he dies. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. She... God, man, I... I don't even know how to put into, like, more words just how much I love Monica as a character. I can't fit any more words in my word salad that I'm gushing over it's, about Monica it's, right it's now. It's literally, I am gushing, but I am also talking about some good things about her character. Right. She's just got a lot of good stuff going on from a writing perspective. Uh, I think she was handled really well. She's not really... Ironically enough, she doesn't have a moment wasted as a character. Which is funny considering <laughs> that she's the only one you can't actually fucking date. But... Uh, <laughs> yeah. She's she's handled really uh, well. Natsuki, I think... Well, we already said Natsuki and Yuri are the most wasted. I think Natsuki has a lot more potential than Yuri does, but she doesn't get utilized as much as Yuri does, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Sayori yeah. is good, but for different reasons. Not necessarily as a character, but for what she represents as a character. And like Jer said, Monica is the only real important character in this bunch, and she mm -hmm. doesn't have a single moment, I don't think, where she's really underutilized or used poorly. She's got plenty of yeah. good foreshadowing that isn't really that, like, uh, in your face, except for maybe the blue the screen. Poems, I think dude. the blue screen is a little much, but it's fun. The blue screen was much, but it, it was funny, it's and fun, I, I enjoyed yeah. that bit. And the poems, the poems, the poems just reveal so much, man. The poems for all four girls are great, because all of them kind of, like, tell you a lot about them as people. And, like, granted, yeah, the other three girls are a lot more, like, at face value, with a little bit more going on underneath. Um, but Monica's poems are all either about her epiphany of becoming aware, or they're about you and how much she loves you. So, like, it's, it's poetry, and it's not something you're going to catch on immediately, unless you're a writer. But, like, if you go through all of Monica's poems that she shares with you, and some of them are in two parts also, by the way. I didn't even know this, but her hole-in-the-wall poem that she shares with you in Act 1, she shares the second half of that poem with you in Act 2, when she sh normally shares the first half with you. But, you know, it's after Sayori's gone. She shares, it's called Hole in the Wall Part 2, and it's literally just the second half of that whole poem, and I didn't even realize that was a thing until my, uh, my first replay through, and I was like, wait, there's more to this Hole in the Wall poem? And I read through the second half, and I was like, holy fuck, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I was like, dude, cool. there's a lot of shit going on in this poem right here, holy shit. Because <laughs> the first half is just like, the first Yo. half of Hole in the Wall is just like the first half of the game. It's unassuming and it's a poem about like oh god i don't even know how to fucking explain it i guess like i mean the title itself hole in the wall it's, it's like monica herself is peeling is like peeking through the hole in the wall yeah to you through the screen and i i really like that let's see if i can find cool. it right here here we go hole in the Yo, wall this poem hit different though yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah buddy but like her I think her first half of Hole in the Wall, if I'm reading right, is more about, yeah, a hole of infinite choices. I realize now that I wasn't looking in, I was looking out, and he on the other side was looking in. The first half of Hole in the Wall is literally about her realization that she's in a fucking video game. And then Hole in the Wall yeah. 2, literally the first line of Hole in the Wall Part 2 is, but he wasn't looking at me. 
Uh, confused, I frantically glance at my surroundings, but my eyes can no longer see color. Are there others in this room? Are they talking? Or are they simply poems on flat sheets of paper? Like, oh, that's, that's, that's only so half good. of the second half of Hole in the Wall, but the second half is clearly about her jealousy that she can't have what the other girls can. You. And some I, save me is another poem apparently that also has a part one and two she gives you the first half of save me in act one and the second half in act two and the second half in act two is like missing um it's like missing letters in some of the words and it, it's just like kind of makes no sense um but it like it kind of does you know in a weird like nonsensical way and it's kind of just like Again, it's, like, symbolic of how, like, fucking, like, out of the bag the game gets in Act 2. Because it's just... Monica is so, like, desperately trying to keep that fucking game together at that point. Because it's just so broken. And it's just not working without Sayori there. And... Yeah. It's just... It's kind of heartbreaking at the end when you do delete her. Because she kind of just comes to the, her own realization that she's thrown everything away for you. And she just went up, she, like, she has her own realization that she went about it in, like, the totally wrong fucking way. And she, like, feels some remorse of what she did. She's like, I fucking did horrible, disgusting things to my friends. And then, you know, she tells you that they were deleted forever, but that's how you get to, like, the act four, the final part of the game, is she basically tells you, like, she tells you that you make her sick because you deleted her after everything that she did. And then she, like, leaves for a little bit, and then she comes back and says that she still loves you, and she can't help it, but she does. And then she tells you the truth, that she didn't permanently delete the club members or the club because she couldn't bring herself to do it, because even though she knew they weren't real, they were still her friends, and she still cared about them, and the literature club was still hers, and she still gave a shit about it. And she couldn't find it in herself to permanently delete them, so she held on to them. And she restores the whole game for you, just without her. And it's such a, like, it's such a bittersweet, like, sacrifice, almost. Where it's like, you know, it just comes back to the, like, I understand what you're going through, girl, but... God, you just went about it in such a bad way, you know? And that's what makes her so good as well. Like, she realizes... That what she did was bad. Like, it's like, to go back to the Thanos point, it's like, they see themselves as doing the right thing, but Monica eventually sees that, hey, you're not happy with yeah, this. Yeah, she what eventually I did comes was to the understanding bad. that she was in the wrong. Because she even says, like, I destroyed this world that you came to be a part of, that you wanted to be a part of. How could I do that to the person that I love? Like, she, yeah, she oh, feels so the remorse. Good. She h hits that point where she's like, oh, God, what have I done? And she tries to make it up to you in, like, bringing the whole game back and just removing herself from it. So you get Sayori back. And it almost works. She's basically the image I sent to you guys. <laughs> what, just now? Sorry, little one. Yeah, just oh, yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, little <laughs> Yeah, that's literally her <laughs> deleting her friends. And then that's you when you're deleting her. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Thanos just, I'm sorry, little one. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's good. But yeah, and it, her, like, gift to you for, like, forgiveness of restoring the whole game almost works, except for the fact that being club president, Sayori is now aware. And Sayori is now exhibiting the same, like, fucking obsessive behavior that Monica and uh, Yuri were exhibiting. And Monica, despite not being a fucking figure or even having a name because her character file is still gone, she returns and deletes Sayori, and she just hits you with a couple, like, text boxes that you have to click OK on, where she's just like, I was wrong, there's no happiness here, goodbye Sayori, goodbye Literature Club, goodbye player, and then the yeah. whole game just closes, and then it comes back, and she, like, signals... She, like, connects to you via signal, whatever it is that she does, and she sings Your Reality, which is the song that she wrote for you. And then, while the credits play, she's just fucking casually deleting everything in the background. <laughs> and then you... Oh, I love You that. get a thank you note from her that basically says, like, thank you for, uh, thank you for, like, playing... 
it, it's essentially a thank you for playing, but it's like from Monica. It's essentially like a suicide note, honestly. And it's like a thank you for playing, thank you for trying to make everyone happy. Um with love, Monica. And then my mm-hmm. favorite part about it is that just to like that final little detail of like meta gameplay that it does so well is that it closes itself and if you open doki doki back up it just puts you back on that note screen with her goodbye note and then it just kicks you out of the game again and if you want to replay the whole game from start to finish you have to go into the game files and you have to run this thing in the files called reset which resets the whole fucking thing because if you go into the game files and like you look at like the if you look at like the CG folder where the CGs are or whatever, those are gone. If you go to the character file, all the character files are gone. Like everything is gone. Monica legitimately deleted everything in the game. The only thing you have left is an empty game folder called Doki Doki Literature Club that has a bunch of empty folders and the reset program. Yeah, or you can just, you know, uninstall, reinstall on Steam. Yeah. Easy peasy. Which is also, I think, what you had to do with the original version. It's funny because in Plus, they have, like, this, uh... It's like a revamped HUD system where... It's kind of like in Super Hot. uh, for anyone who's played Super Hot, when you load up Super Hot oh, as a game, game, it goes into, like, this, like, fake computer boot screen, and then you have to boot Super Hot from that, you know? Um... Doki Doki Literature Club Plus is, like, the same thing. It does, like, a fake boot-up menu that you have to, like... It it always boots directly to Doki Doki Literature Club, but if you quit Doki Doki Literature Club, it takes you to the fake boot-up menu where you can access, like, side stories, and that's where you can go into the game files. Um, There's, like, you could... There's, like, an image gallery where you can look at the... All the CG art, and uh, doing certain things unlocks, uh, like... Uh, both like if you get the CG art in the normal route in Act One, then you unlock the CG art in the gallery. But like doing certain things, like there was some art that I unlocked in Plus by selecting a certain word during a poem, during the poem mini game, and it unlocks like uh, it unlocks like pre-development like concept sketches of the girls and shit like that. Like, there's a bunch of never-before-seen, like, concept artwork of the girls from before the game was in development that's in Plus as, like, unlockables. And it's really fucking cool. Nice! Okay. Yeah. But... Oh, yeah, one more thing that I want to, you know, just bring up is, like, the good ending to this game, where you go through all the scenes with the girls, but you just keep on saving. Yeah. And then uh, Sayori becomes the actual president. And she just talks about how she was really happy that you joined the club, but she already knew that you were going to join the club because she's the president. Yeah. And she just goes through, like, a really nice and emotional, like, heartfelt moment just thanking you for hanging out with her and for all the other girls just to make them happy. That's the, like, secret ending, because the normal ending is after you get through the end of the game after Monica's deleted. And Sayori, once she reveals that she's club president, that's when she starts getting, like, obsessive, and then Monica interjects. But if you've gone through the game and you've, like, full-routed each girl... Like, I think you have to, like, write your poems for whichever girl all three times. For all of them, yeah. Yeah, like, if you're doing Natsuki, then all three of your poems have to be just for Natsuki kind of thing. Um, If When you go through for all three girls, I think on the last one, Sayori just... Instead of getting obsessive, she just basically gives you another, like, Monica suicide note. Like, thank you for playing and thank you for trying to make everyone happy. You did... She yeah, basically like, thanks like you ha- because the whole point that she had for getting you into the literature club was so that you would make more friends. And she thanks you, yeah. the player, for making her happy by doing just that. By playing through the game and getting to know all the girls. Yeah, like, it, like it's a really cool, like, secret good ending. Like, Sayori talks about how, like, uh, you comforted, comforted us through our hard times, you know? Yeah. Helped us get along together with each other. And because I'm president now, you know, I understand everything. And you really didn't want to miss a single thing in this game, did you? <laughs> you saved and loaded so many times just to make sure you could spend time with everyone. Yeah. Someone who truly cares about the literature club would go that far. But uh, for everyone to be happy and care about each other, oh man, just it's so good. Like, after all you've done for us, there isn't much I can do for you in return. We've already reached the end of the game. This is where we say goodbye. Thank you for playing DDLC. 
Come visit us sometime, okay? Yep. We'll always be here. We, we all love you. Like, that's such a sweet and heartfelt moment for such a good secret ending. That, and, and it's the one time in which, like, we see a character go president mode, but not go insane. Yeah. And I love that. That was so fun. It says right here in, uh, at the end of Monica's uh, wiki entry, uh, if the good ending is achieved, Sayori will thank the player for spending time with all the girls. Monica will still delete the game, but the CGs will not be deleted, and a letter from Dan Salvato, rather than Monica, thanking the player for playing his game will show. Yeah, it's, it's just so adorable, especially when it's Sayori, of all people, yep. just saying thank you. Because we see her mainly at the first part of the game, but not at all for the end, until, you know... The files get reset and all, yeah. where she's back again. Uh, and I, I just feel like it's a really symbolic that it's Sayori, you know, saying and thanking everyone for, you know, playing the game. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's... God, this is just such a good game, man. Oh, it really is. I... Oh, no, now I'm all giddy because of you. <laughs> God damn you, Dylan. I highly recommend, even if you have seen gameplay or if you listen to this podcast without yeah. playing yeah like the not plus plus costs like i think it's on sale right now because it just released yesterday at the time of recording this bucks. it's like 13 bucks and it's normally 15 uh the original doki doki is free on both the website and on steam just go fucking play the game man even if you if you listen to this whole yeah. podcast and you didn't care about spoilers I still heavily recommend playing this game. It's got so much fun little details. It's got so much good stuff going on. The twist, even with the twist being there and you playing through it, it's still got tons of fun little details and things that you can pick out. It's got plenty of stuff that we didn't even mention as far as like scares and like overall like psychological like shifts go. Like there's so much that we didn't even talk about. We just kind of covered the girls, honestly. Yeah, we didn't talk about much of the scares at all, especially like Natsuki's like head. We, crack we briefly and mentioned the, the the head snap, but we didn't like mention, uh, yeah. mention it. Yuri's got plenty of unnerving stuff going on in Act Two when she kind of takes the over. The real eyes, all oh, the eyes, <laughs> dude. The fucking oh, eyes, yeah. I hate that. So, yeah, I high recommend going and playing this game, man. Oh, yeah! Oh, Dylan, Dylan, but before we, you know, keep on going with this, like, now that we actually finished up the serious stuff, let's talk about my five head moments, Howie, <laughs> because I think those are so funny, so, dude. Oh, my Jared God. Jared and I, we'll, we'll, this will be a fun note to end this podcast on. Uh, Jared and I mentioned pretty casually, I think, throughout the Danganronpa episodes while Joey was still playing through the series of his fucking ultimate five head talent. And how he would just casually predict shit that was exactly right before he'd even get to it. And mm -hmm. he did the same fucking thing in Doki Doki Literature Club. I don't remember exactly what it was, but there was a moment uh, where Joey was just like... See. He's just like, as casually as fucking possible, was just like, Oh, I bet Monica's jealous, so she's killing the other club members. Like, I don't know if that was it, but it was basically something like uh, that. It was just like, and I just, yeah, I just, just like, like oh, muted my mic, and I just I threw my hands up, and I was like, how does he fucking do it? How? Like, he hasn't even gotten through the second day of the first act yet. How? <laughs> like... And yeah, it's just like, oh, I, I see what you're doing. You, you want to try and kill everyone based on the wording of this poem. Yeah. Oh, I see. You're you want to delete all these girls, don't you, that, Monica? You want to kill was. them all. I see. He read, like, one of her poems <laughs> on the second or third day, and he's like, oh, you just want to kill everyone so you can have me all to yourself, don't you, Monica? And I muted my mic, and yeah, I was I like, I was like, how? How does he fucking do this? <laughs> and then when it got to the point where that was what was happening, he acted all surprised, and I was like, shut the fuck up, Joey. You, you knew... You knew, subconsciously maybe, but you knew. Subconsciously, <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh yeah, and, the, uh, and then the moments with Yuri, dude. Oh my god, I was just like, oh, you have my pen, Yuri? Ah, I sure hope you didn't use it for, you know, <laughs> jacking off he, or whatever. He made like a casual little, ah uh, ha ha, I hope you didn't use it to masturbate or anything. Ah uh, ha ha. And then me uh, and I think Percy was in chat with us watching at the time. Both me and Percy in the fucking spoilers chat were like, I can't, I fucking hate this kid, man. <laughs> And then, like, and two then minutes you, later, Yuri was oh like, yeah, God. I masturbated with your pen. And Joey was like, what the fuck? 
not only that, you, <laughs> but soon after that as well, when she was Dude, like, this was, oh, this can was I keep Dylan. your poem? This was basically Dylan. I'm sending you pictures. Oh my god, yes, <laughs> dude. <laughs> but yeah, not only that, but like, when, when, when Yuri, when we were sharing perfect. poems with Yuri as well, Yuri was like, oh, can I have your poem? And I was like, yeah, go ahead, keep the poem. Go sniff it or something while you, you know, masturbate. And guess what? She said she actually sniffed to it. Like, oh my god, why? She literally tells Stop you the next it. day that's exactly right. what she did with your poem that night. And you're just like, man. <laughs> Joey was like, man. Joey like put the sag emote in the chat. And he's like, I hate being the ultimate five head boys. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. Why did why I just said that she sniffed my poem for funsies. Why did she actually sniff it? I said she used my pen. I said she used my pen for masturbation. Why did she actually do it? Why? Why why am I so right about these sometimes? I don't oh, like it. God. Not for these kinds of things, man. No. God. <laughs> Every time Joey has like a five head moment, the rest of us are just like yes. this. <laughs> John Tron Giff, I yes, just looking dude. at the screen. <laughs> Man, yo, God. I remember, like, like Dylan. After you like witnessed all of those moments, you were just like, he can't keep getting away. With That's this. what I posted in <laughs> chat after like the third time. He just casually said exactly what was gonna happen next. I just posted in the Doki Doki spoiler chat. I was like, he can't keep getting away with this. <laughs> I still think the most like stupidly five head thing i came up with was kaede being the ultimate shot putter i can i will never get over that it's dude. so stupidly inaccurate but it's so scarily close to what is accurate and that's what made us all <laughs> upset oh. i still can't believe you fucking got kaito right right off the back when i didn't see the lower <laughs> to see <laughs> and not seeing his jacket because the jacket's a dead giveaway right. but just seeing his head and he's just like, oh yeah, he's probably the ultimate astronaut. Well, wasn't it like, at the beginning of E3 before they all got their talents? Like, he just saw Kaito no, was, in casual uh, no, clothes, and no. he's just like, I bet that guy's... No, 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 it, was, no, no. it was when I was guessing, like, the ultimates just from the picture of the cast alone that oh, someone said. Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was just like, yeah, yeah, sure, he's an ultimate astronaut, why not? Go for I it. I mean, yeah. we're, we're giving you credit for correctly guessing that Kaito was ultimate astronaut, but let us also remember mm -hmm. that you guessed Shuichi was the ultimate security guard. <laughs> hey, I don't care, man. I swear, <laughs> if you actually look at his design, he looks so much like he a security guard. He kind of does have a little bit man. of a security guard look to him, I suppose. I don't, I don't trust Suichi to trust a bat. Uh, fuck. <laughs> you want to try that again? <laughs> yeah, let me. Yeah, go, go. Let, let me try that again. Take it slow. Too. I don't trust Suichi to guard a bag of Chex Mix. Let alone being a fucking security guard at a Walmart. <laughs> yeah, or I wouldn't. Like, knowing what a Shuichi is actually like, I wouldn't trust him to guard anything either. But like from first looks alone, he really does have a security guard vibe, man. I don't care what you say. Yeah, he's supposed to be an ultimate dipshit. He's supposed. To, if he was gonna be a security guard, he's gonna look a little bit like fit. Yeah, he would look more like Gonta. To be fair, you know what? Fair point. Yeah, touche, <laughs> touche. All right. Well, that's uh. Fuck man, that's that's, that's the end of Doki Doki Literature Club. I don't even know. For, why. for now, we, we like I said, we might do a we might do a follow up episode at some point talking about the side story stuff and what it adds to the story and the characters. Um, yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, so probably won't be for a little while. Uh, maybe it'll be maybe not the next off topic, but the one after that maybe. Um, DDLC Part Two, you know. Yeah. We're, pro we're probably gonna uh, do what? Go back to Danganronpa after this one? Just we yeah, had like, a couple weeks yeah, break. The, we had a couple weeks break. I wanted to do Danganronpa Jeopardy, but I haven't had the time to like set the game up, which I need to because I have one online that I want to use. But all the questions on there are like super fucking easy. Like one of the categories is voice actors, right? And I was like, oh, I was like, yo, that's one of the categories I was hoping would be on here. What's the hardest question? And then I looked at the hardest question, and it was like. It was like the ultimate lucky student, Nagito Komaida, shares the same English voice actor as what character? And I was like, this is your hardest question, huh? Literally fucking babies know this answer. Like, th this is your hardest question, huh? So I was like, oh I was like, all right, God, I'm going to have to change these because I can edit it. But I was like, I got to go through and come ah, up with some okay. harder questions, you know? And I got to do that myself because I don't know who all is going to be on to play it yet. But if I get someone to and help, can't then they're going to know. Exactly. Then you're going to know the answers. Yeah, we can't Because you're going to know the questions. So, like, I, I can't. We'll bring, it, we'll bring on Noah. Yeah. Well, I was already hoping Noah oh, yeah, would no, do it. Yeah, Noah would be good. 
Because I figure, I figure I'd run the game, and then Jer, you, uh, I figure like team two teams of two, so like probably you, Joey, and then maybe Noah and either Dustin or Scoot, depending on who wants to do, and then uh, just kind of go from there. So like I'd run the game, and then it'd be two teams of two. I don't really know how to like figure out who gets what question though since there's no buzzers and just everyone screaming over the mic to go first would be kind of not great so i don't know well maybe maybe you can get like some sort of like i don't know like some sort of clicker like online clicker to click in and you can like see who clicked in first or whatever i don't know but yeah uh next week we're uh Oh? We, we've been taking a couple weeks off because I've been needing a break and I wanted to do that, but I haven't had the time to do it. So expect Dang and Rumpa Jeopardy soon, just not now. I'm um, I'm going to be editing Town of Salem soon. Yeah, we're most likely tomorrow, trying to get back on the video editing. Jer's been busy working, and I've been busy working. Oh. I'm starting to kind of want to get back into editing too, though. I've mainly just needed a break. But uh, expect, expect yep. me to never show up again. <laughs> <laughs> Later, boys. <laughs> well, we're definitely well, going to have more guests well, in uh, the next season. Yeah, but, mm-hmm. yeah next week, uh, th- this is going up. God, what day are we recording this? The first. We are recording this on the 1st, on a Thursday. So it's not going to be almost another week until you guys hear this. But next week, after Ooh, this boy. comes out, expect us to get back to Danganronpa. Starting with Mr. fucking Hajime. With his dumb fucking oh, the, spear, the worst outlet. pro tag. The fucking uh, the boy who is the best yet worst <laughs> pro tag. Yes, <laughs> he's right I, in the I fucking middle. I still stand by DR two. I still stand by DR two being the worst game. I don't care. But yeah, starting Danganronpa two oh, forward, we, we probably. I can gonna... feel the fires. Yeah, <laughs> I can feel. I can. I can feel. I can already feel my house being burned down, dude. Oh, <laughs> same, dude. I. I don't care, man. DR two has Rampa, the worst cast. I. DR two. Danganronpa two is the. It was the worst game the, and the yeah, worst this cast. Is, this oh, is definitely going to spoil how we feel going into Danganronpa two. But oh, Danganronpa yeah. two is the weakest out of the three games by far. But yeah, I, I, I just... Oh. They had a character that I actively enjoyed watching die. Yeah. Let that sink in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hiyoko. Oh, that's going to be so well, fun. Oh, we'll, we'll just be... dunking on her so many times. Oh, yeah. we'll, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming next week. Uh, expect more guests from our friends on the Major Ego Network channel. Whatever you want to fucking call us. We're going to have more friends on. We're going to do more fun stuff. Uh, yeah. More videos coming. We just need to get off our asses. So we just we just need a couple days off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we no, understand. We need a couple days off, man. Yeah. Busy bees. Pretty mm-hmm. much. Uh, any any parting words you want to throw out into the into the ether there, Joey? Uh, well, you know, I get the uh, special right to claim that I was the first individual guest. So, uh, haha, suck it, Noah. Suck it, Dustin. <laughs> suck it, everyone else. Uh, I'm the true winner after all of this. So, uh, I mean, yeah, what else can I say? Dang. Well, <laughs> this will be your last official appearance yeah. then. Bye, Joey. Damn. <laughs> so, uh,. I'm going into the, the I'm going into the character files right now. Hold on. Um, where is it? Where is it? Ah, there he is. All right, Joey's been deleted. Any left? Joey's been deleted from the game. So uh, we'll we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Are you kicking the server? Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>